Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for a history video. Right now on this channel, I plan on alternating between videos that are a deeper dive on a specific topic and top 10 videos that are more broad. This week we're doing one of those top 10s, and March is Women's History Month, so I thought it would be a good time to look at the 10 most influential medieval women. People often think of women in the Middle Ages as being completely under the control of their husband or male relatives, and there is often an image of medieval women as not really doing anything notable. And while it is true that women often had to fight for control of their own lives, especially noble women, it is overly broad to think of women in the Middle Ages as nothing but nuns and wives who made no contributions of their own. As we'll see in this video, there were highly successful female rulers, businesswomen, writers, and scholars, and I mean, this video isn't an exhaustive list either. There were plenty of powerful and influential women in the Middle Ages. I should note that for the purposes of this video, and really most of my videos, I have defined the Middle Ages as the period between about 500 and 1450 CE. In other words, from right around the fall of Rome to the invention of the printing press. I'm also focusing primarily on Europe. As is the case with any list, some people probably won't be super happy with this because their favorite medieval woman won't be on it, so I apologize if she's not, but for me, these are the 10 medieval women I think are the most influential. All right, let's get to the list. Number 10, I have Licorisha of Winchester, the only Jewish woman to make this list. She was a highly influential figure in the England of the 13th century. As I've mentioned in earlier videos, a decent chunk of Jews ended up in the field of money lending because many other avenues were closed to them, like working in crafts or owning land. In addition to that, Christians were barred from loaning money at interest to other Christians, and these factors combined to create a niche that medieval Jews filled. Their services helped to create a credit economy in medieval European cities. It was not especially unusual for a Jewish woman to be a moneylender, but Licorisha is arguably the most successful Jewish businesswoman of the entire Middle Ages. Licorisha was the most successful moneylender in England, and she served on the royal court of Henry III of England as a financial advisor. This position also made her the de facto leader of the English Jewish community, with other Jews approaching her with issues to bring up at the court. One really interesting thing about Licorisha is that she was so highly successful and so famous in 13th century England that her children chose to use her name and not their father's name. Typically, medieval Jews used patronymic names, that is, names that mentioned the name of their father, like Ben Yehuda means son of Judah. But her children, including her sons, chose to use Ben Licorisha instead, something quite strange in medieval Jewish history. Licorisha overall has a very fascinating life that we don't have time to dive into deeply here, but there is a great book about her that you can find a link to in the description. At number 9, I have Hrosvitha of Gondersheim, a 10th century German secular canonist, poet, and playwright. A secular canonist is not quite a nun, uh, but they were women who did everything they could, short of a traditional monastic oath, to dedicate themselves to Christianity. Typically, they were widows or daughters of nobility who did not wish to marry, but who didn't want to go all the way to being nuns either. While they were generally celibate, they did not take vows of poverty, and they could choose to leave at any time, unlike medieval nuns. Rosvita lived at Gondersheim Abbey in what is today Germany. Unfortunately, we don't really know what circumstances led to her living there, as we can only glean some basic information about her from the prefaces to her works, and she wasn't exactly forthcoming about biographical details. We do know that she is the earliest known female writer of any kind from medieval Germany, one of the main things she focuses on is plays. That might not sound especially notable, but the art of theater had been pretty much dead in the Latin West since the fall of the Roman Empire. Rosvita wrote the first plays in the Latin West in over 400 years. She mostly wrote religious plays that were about the lives of saints, but she also wrote a couple of romantic dramas. Her work caught the attention of the Ottonian dynasty of Holy Roman Emperors, and her plays were likely performed at the courts of both Otto I and Otto II, reviving theater in the West. At number eight, I have Marie de France, another medieval woman who made major literary contributions. Like Rosvita, we unfortunately don't know as much about her as we would like, and pretty much all we have to go on are little clues in her prefaces. The sum total of what we know about her is this. Her name was Marie, she was born in France, and she worked in England during the reigns of Henry II and Richard I. She is notable because she was the first woman to write poetry in one of the French languages. At the time, French as a completely unified language wasn't a thing. There were various related French languages, though, and one of them was called Francienne, and that is the language she wrote in. 
That might sound a little strange for England, but England at the time spoke a hybrid French-English language called Anglo-Norman, and the higher classes all knew French, so they could understand her poetry. In general, at the time she was writing, people didn't see writing in vernacular languages very positively. A vernacular language is your native language, or the language or languages you learn as part of your upbringing. The opposite of a vernacular language in the medieval world was Latin, a language you had to be highly educated to understand and write in. Most medieval poets before Marie stuck to Latin, something that would gradually change until the pendulum swung in the other direction, with later poets like Dante and Chaucer also writing in vernacular languages and rejecting the use of Latin altogether. She also popularized narrative poetry, that is, poems that tell an extended story. Some of her poems did involve religion, but she also wrote many works that were more secular. She is considered by some to be the originator of chivalric romance literature, which involved knights going on brave adventures with various romantic interludes involving life in a royal court. Marie saw most of her work as fables. In other words, they were stories that had a moral at the end. And in general, she was a big fan of fables. In addition to writing her own stuff, she also translated some of Aesop's fables into Anglo-Norman. Anyway, we aren't sure what her life was like at all, and some think she may have been a nun, but this seems kind of unlikely to me because of the subject matter of some of her poems, which involved adulterous relationships. She also likely would have written in Latin if she was a nun. But we can't know for sure. At least, we don't know right now. Whoever she was exactly, her work has lived on and had a major influence on European literary traditions. At number seven, I have Ethelfled of Mercia, the first ruler we've talked about so far. During her life, England was divided into several small kingdoms. Her father, known as Alfred the Great, was the King of Wessex. During his reign, there were lots of Viking attacks, and they even began to conquer swaths of England. Alfred gets the credit for coming up with a better defensive strategy against the Vikings that halted their further advances, and he parlayed that success into becoming the overlord of the other English kingdoms, including one called Mercia. As part of the deal to become the overlord of Mercia, Alfred married his daughter, Ethelfled, to the king of Mercia, a man named Ethelred. So she became the queen of Mercia. There was one really big cultural difference between Mercia and Wessex. Wives of kings were often involved in governing in Mercia, while they were more or less barred from it in Wessex. This greatly benefited Ethelfled. She was a highly respected woman who was very involved in governing Mercia. She learned a lot from her father and was really focused on building more Viking resistant fortifications within Mercia, with the city of Worcester being their greatest focus. Ethelred was significantly older than she was and he fell ill about 10 years into their marriage, at which point she became de facto ruler of Mercia. In the 890s, there was a new wave of Viking attempts to conquer Mercia but they found that the fortifications that Ethelfled had made on cities like Worcester and Manchester were too strong for them, and Ethelfled led her army in battle to push them back into the Danelaw, the Viking territory in England. After years of illness, Ethelfled's husband died in 911, and she began to rule Mercia entirely on her own with the title Lady of Mercia. She was the only female ruler in all of Anglo-Saxon history, and she continued to effectively halt Viking invasions in the region until her death in 918. At number six, I have Trota of Salerno, a 12th century Italian physician who wrote two major works on medicine. She's also sometimes erroneously called Trotula. So if you've heard that name, that's the same person as Trota. On the face of it, it isn't that strange in Trota's time for a woman to be a medical professional. For a long time in the medieval Christian world, women were actually viewed more as experts because folk medical traditions were generally handed down through the centuries by women and not men. In fact, that's part of a reason women begin to be targeted as witches in the later Middle Ages when a more established medical curriculum is created and people are awarded medical degrees. It starts to become a problem that these women also say they're treating people and their activities start to be viewed as witchcraft. But, you know, I'll go deeper on that someday, probably in another video. But the point is, it's not that unique for Trota to be a medieval female physician. What is unique about her, though, is that she composed her own medical text, something that even most male physicians at the time just weren't doing. First, she was probably the first medieval physician to start to challenge some of the medical ideas of antiquity. Most medieval physicians, both Jewish and Christian, largely accepted the ideas of ancient physicians like Galen and Hippocrates. Most medieval people saw the authority of these ancient doctors as absolute and didn't feel the need to do things like record their own observations and how they related to ancient medical ideas. They just didn't feel they had anything new to add. 
One of the core ideas of ancient and medieval medicine was humor theory, which is the idea that there are four different types of fluid in the human body. If someone's healthy, their body has the right equilibrium between these four fluids. If someone is unhealthy, it means that there's an imbalance in these fluids. This is why the idea of bloodletting was a thing and made sense to people, because many diseases were thought to be caused by excess blood. Anyway, Trotha did not completely reject humor theory, but she did point out some instances where she knows the work of ancient physicians was just wrong based on her own observations, and that just wasn't something people did at the time. This type of testing and observation wouldn't really be commonplace until the scientific revolution, which didn't begin until the 16th century, so Trotha was before her time. She's also notable for being the first person to compose an entire work that was about gynecological disorders, and it is in this work, De Curis Mulierum, that she describes several diseases for the first time in history, like endometriosis. While others had written books that contained some information on the subject, Trota was the first to focus on an exhaustive discussion of such disorders all in a single work. Her works were widely circulated throughout the Middle Ages, and once universities did begin to emerge, Italy became one of the centers for studying medicine, and her various books were required reading, giving her a lasting influence on European medicine. At number five, I have Eleanor of Aquitaine, who is a major contender for most powerful woman of the Middle Ages, since she wielded considerable military and political power. She was from a region of what is today France, called then the Duchy of Aquitaine, it may not make a ton of sense to us today, but the Lord of Aquitaine actually wielded more power than the King of France at this point. The king only directly governed a small territory around Paris. This meant that the rulers of Aquitaine, while technically vassals of the king, had a much larger army and a lot more money than the king did. Her father was the duke of this massive territory, and he viewed Eleanor as the most intelligent of his three children and gave her the best education possible as a result. When her father died, she was the only remaining heir, and this meant that she became the Duchess of Aquitaine at his death. She then married the future King of France, Louis VII, with the idea that their children would hold the title of king, along with the massive territory of the Aquitaine. However, their marriage had many problems. For one thing, they just weren't very compatible. Eleanor was very extroverted and liked having a good time. She was a social butterfly, basically, while her husband was incredibly pious and boring from her perspective. They ultimately went on the Second Crusade together, with her army actually larger than what the king could muster. Their marriage eventually fell apart after a major disagreement during the Crusade, a crusade which ultimately ended in failure. Eleanor convinced her pious husband that their marriage had not been ordained by God, and they managed to get an annulment, which was not always easy at the time. Shortly thereafter, she married Henry II, the future king of England. This set up centuries of conflict between England and France since the heirs of this union would claim the Aquitaine, Normandy, and England as their own territory, and the King of France didn't really like that. There were some rocky moments in this marriage too, and at one point Eleanor was accused of plotting to help one of her sons overthrow Henry, and she was imprisoned for the rest of his reign as a result. After his death, though, her son Richard, better known as Richard the Lionheart, became king and freed her, and she resumed her life as a powerful medieval woman. Richard was barely ever in England between the Third Crusade and a war with France, so Eleanor was very involved in governing in his absence. She even had to find a way to free Richard after he was captured and ransomed in Germany on his way home from the Third Crusade. So in addition to all of these political accomplishments, Eleanor was also a major patron of troubadours, individuals who played songs and told stories, generally stories of chivalric romance and courtly love, the same genre that Marie de France is credited for creating. As I mentioned when talking about Marie, her work was popular at the court of Henry II and Richard I, and the reason for that is Eleanor. These stories became increasingly popular as a result of her patronage, and that's a major reason why, when you think about the Middle Ages, you think of troubadours and knights in shining armor and damsels in distress and all of those sorts of things. At number four, I have Theodora of Byzantium. I'm perhaps stretching things a little bit to include her on this list, since most of the time you will see historians look at the Byzantine Empire as a separate entity from medieval Europe, and it kind of is. After all, a big chunk of the Byzantine Empire isn't even in Europe, and they're also linguistically different. But Theodora's life story and her contributions are too interesting not to include her here. So the Byzantine Empire is the continuation of the Eastern Roman Empire. You know, when the Roman Empire fell in the West, the Eastern part of the empire didn't fall, and it would continue on, eventually sort of rebranded as the Byzantine Empire. And that's the world Theodora is operating in, in the very early Byzantine Empire, not that long after the Western Roman Empire fell. She made a lot of contributions and also has a really fascinating life story. She was born into a poor family and she was an actress, 
which is seen as a glamorous occupation today, but it was viewed rather negatively during her time, partly because they also tended to be prostitutes. Eventually, she caught the eye of Justinian, who was the son of the Byzantine emperor. There was specifically a law in the books that said high-ranking people couldn't marry actresses, but Justinian got rid of that law and married her in 525. Theodora is described as a brilliant and imposing woman, and she and Justinian seem to have truly been in love, something you don't see a lot at this point in history. Once he became emperor in 527, she wasn't just the emperor's wife, she was an empress, and Justinian wanted her to rule as his equal, so she did. Early on during their rule in 532, there was a major riot in the city as a result of some of Justinian's less popular policies, and they were aiming to overthrow him and put a new emperor on the throne. The rioters were getting the best of the Byzantine army, at which point Justinian began to plan a way for he and his court to escape Constantinople. Theodora spoke at this meeting and reportedly said the following, Those whose interests are threatened by extreme danger should think only of the wisest course of action. In my opinion, flight is not a wise course of action, even if it should bring us to safety. It is impossible for a person, having been born into this world, not to die. But for who has reigned, it is intolerable to be a fugitive. May I never be deprived of this purple robe, and may I never see the day when those who meet me do not call me empress. If you wish to save yourself, my lord, there's no difficulty. We're rich. Over there is the sea, and we have many ships. Yet reflect for a moment whether, once you have escaped to a place of security, you would not gladly exchange such safety for death. As for me, I agree with the adage that royal purple is the noblest shroud. Theodora's speech ultimately convinced Justinian and his court that they should stay and fight, and that's what they did, ultimately putting an end to the attempted coup. While the wording of her speech is very likely at least partially invented, it is clear that she delivered a speech at this meeting that convinced Justinian to stay. Without Theodora, Justinian likely would have left, and his reign would have been over. Thanks to Theodora, he would continue to reign for 30 more years. Theodora wouldn't live as long as Justinian, as she died in 548. However, while she was empress, she and Justinian oversaw many projects, including the construction of Hagia Sophia, which was the largest church in the world for almost a millennium, and an attempted reconquest of the Western Roman Empire. Notably, one of her major projects as empress was to help poor women. After all, she began life as a poor woman herself. She frequently bought female slaves who had been sold into prostitution, freed them, and helped them start a new life. She also helped pass laws that expanded the rights of divorced women and increased their property ownership rights, among other things. At number three, I have Joan of Arc, who is probably the most famous medieval woman, at least when it comes to name recognition. Joan was a 15th century peasant girl and mystic who received visions from various saints that she should help the French in their war against the English. During her lifetime, it was the latter stage of the Hundred Years' War. The war was not going so great for the French at the time, who had suffered one crushing defeat at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, and the English were advancing south and besieging Orléans. However, Joan arrived on the scene and convinced the desperate French king of her mystical visions, at which point she was given armor, a horse, and a banner. Her arrival and her apparent mystical power lifted French morale, or, from their perspective, resulted in a miracle. Suddenly, they were able to break the Siege of Orléans, and from there, the war started to go really badly for the English. For the next year or so, Joan continued charismatically leading troops into battle, and when she did, it seemed like the French army couldn't be beat. Unfortunately for her, Joan was eventually wounded and captured by the Burgundians, allies of the English, and she was ultimately executed for cross-dressing and being a heretic, not for being a witch, as people often seem to think. Joan helped turn the course of the Hundred Years' War, which ultimately resulted in a French victory. She also neatly encapsulates the changes occurring in Europe at the tail end of the Middle Ages. Before the Hundred Years' War, peasants very rarely got involved in wars that didn't directly affect them and their lands. That was the realm of the nobility. However, over the course of the Hundred Years' War, more and more peasants joined the army on both sides, so Joan being a peasant who gets involved in a war reflects that change. She also indicates an emerging national consciousness that just wasn't a thing before the Hundred Years' War. People thought of themselves as residents of their town or city before they thought of themselves as French or English. But that changed over the course of the war too, as the two sides increasingly defined themselves in opposition to one another. Joan's focus on helping France as a national entity reflects this shift. At number two, I have the Frankish queen, Clotilda. I feel like of all the women on this list, she's the one that is most frequently overlooked. She was married to Clovis, 
a Frankish chieftain who would go on to be the first king of the Franks, creating the first powerful state in post-Roman Europe, and founded an entire dynasty of Frankish kings called the Merovingians. Clovis is often thought of as being one of the most important medieval rulers, but I think the importance of Clotilda needs to be emphasized. Clovis is famous for converting to Christianity in the midst of a battle against another Germanic group called the Alemanni. The battle wasn't going very well for him, so he decided to appeal to the god of Christianity, and if he helped him win, he promised he would convert. Ultimately, Clovis won the battle and converted to Christianity. But without Clotilda, it's unlikely that Clovis would have converted to Christianity, or at least the same form of Christianity, that he did. Clotilda herself was a Roman Catholic Christian, and her form of Christianity would be the type that Clovis converted to. This ultimately led to the spread of this form of Christianity throughout pretty much the entirety of Europe. So if Clotilda hadn't been married to Clovis, and hadn't influenced him through her religion, European history would likely be drastically different when it comes to religion. And at number one, I have Hildegard of Bingen. So far, we've been able to use a word or two to describe what field the women on this list have made contributions in, you know, like physician, poet, queen, or playwright. That's a lot harder to do with Hildegard, who was a 12th century German abbess who made contributions in theology, theater, botany, medicine, philosophy, visual arts, linguistics, and music. And I'm probably forgetting something, even with that long of a list. I guess that does mean we can use the word polymath to describe her. As an abbess, she also founded several new convents while managing her own in Bingen. With her wide-ranging contributions, we obviously won't even get close to covering them all here, but we'll hit a few highlights. Hildegard's contributions in botany and medicine are largely intertwined. Before she was made abbess of Bingen, one of her major duties was working in the herbal garden and infirmary at the abbey. She used that knowledge to compose Physica, an encyclopedic work describing the medical value of hundreds of plants. Linguistically, Hildegard created an alternate alphabet and frequently created new Latin words with the intention of creating a special language for she and her nuns to communicate in, increasing their solidarity. In terms of theater and music, she composed the first medieval morality play called Ordo Virtutem, or Order of the Virtues, and she wrote music to accompany it. Theologically, most of her major contributions were mystical. She experienced visions from a young age, and she recorded the contents of those visions and then explained their meaning in books. Within her mystical text, there are also images of these visions. There's some disagreement as to whether Hildegard herself did the illustrations, but at the very least, she oversaw them to make sure they accurately reflected what she saw in her visions. She also wrote one very interesting thing about the idea of original sin, something that has led to some calling her the first feminist. The general idea of the church at the time was that women were to blame for man's fall from the Garden of Eden. After all, it was Eve who ate from the tree first, and she coaxed Adam into doing it. Hildegard was very clever, and she couched her criticism of this idea within patriarchal ideas of the time. And her conclusion about original sin was instead that it was actually Adam's fault, because he should have known better than to listen to a woman. Hildegard's impressive stature within the church, even when looking back from our time, is perhaps best reflected by the fact that in 2012, she was given the title Doctor of the Church, a title given only to those who have made the greatest intellectual contributions to Catholicism, a title only given to 36 people in the almost 2,000 year history of the Catholic Church. To be honest, it's kind of surprising that it took that long for it to happen with everything she accomplished. Those are my picks for the most influential medieval women. Are there any women you think I left out who should have been on the list? Let me know in the comments. Next week, we'll be taking a deeper dive into a particular topic. We're going to look at Christians who converted to Judaism in the Middle Ages. It wasn't a common occurrence, but it did happen, and the cases we have are very interesting. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it, as that will make it so that more people see it. If you want to make sure you catch future videos on this channel, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you're looking for some of my other videos, including other top tens, you should see some of them on your screen now. Thanks for watching.